Today, we continue our Easter series exploring the wild and wonderful book of Revelation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that things are not as they seem. So we turn our eyes, as John of Patmos did, toward the amazing things that are unfolding. Hear these words from chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true, the one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven for my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So friends, last week we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even now we celebrate how the hope of resurrection continues to bring new life into the world. The hope of resurrection means that things are not as they seem. What was dead is now alive. What was hopeless is now brimming with promise. What was lost has now been found. That reversal that shakes things up is all over the place in the book of Revelation. So throughout the Easter season, we are walking through this wild and kind of weird text as we consider what it means to open our eyes to a different way of seeing things. There's a refrain throughout this book of behold or look as though John, who wrote down all the things he saw in his vision, is saying, pay attention. Something is happening. Can you see it? So this morning, we turn to these series of letters that were sent from Jesus himself to the angels of the seven churches in Asia Minor. And we particularly are looking at the message for the church in Philadelphia. While these many letters were particularly sent to churches in a specific place and time, it's kind of neat that there are seven of them. In scripture, seven often is completeness or wholeness. So in a way, these letters are directed to all churches. In each of these letters, Jesus usually has something affirming to say, and then something challenging to say. But well, one of the interesting things about the letter to the Philadelphians is that it's unmistakably positive. Jesus commends them because even though this church is fragile, they are clinging tightly to the hope of resurrection. And friends, I think that is a good word for us to hear this morning too, as we consider what it means to follow Christ in a world where things are not as they seem. You see, by the time John had this remarkable vision, the gospel was spreading and the church was growing. But some of these new Christians were experiencing division in their community as they were trying to figure out what it meant for them to trust in Jesus. In Philadelphia, it may have felt like the way was shut due to some of the pressures they were facing. In their community, it's possible that they were scorned for following Jesus. And as they wrestled with what it meant to follow Jesus, while the surrounding culture followed a different set of values, it probably felt like door after door was being slammed in their faces. Have you ever experienced that? That feeling that doors are closing in your life? Maybe you've experienced disappointment or failure or the loss of a job or a relationship. 
And it gets even more complex when it feels like doors are closing for us because of our choice to follow Jesus. Maybe it's less overt in your case than it was for the Philadelphian church, but perhaps you've also experienced that pressure to conform or wondered if pursuing deeper discipleship is really worth it or wondered why God would call someone like you. Maybe that's why Jesus uses this image of an open door to describe his constant invitation to discipleship and to hope. He says, I know all the things you do. I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Now, I think this imagery of a door is interesting because it's so simple. We use that metaphor of a door in our language all the time. If someone says, hey, my door is always open, that usually means if you have a standing invitation, come on in, let's be hospitable and welcoming. On the other hand, if someone says, well, that door is closed, that usually indicates refusal or a missed opportunity. The simple act of opening or closing a door says a lot about our posture toward one another and toward the world around us. Now, there's an old adage that says, when a door closes, what do you do? Open a window, right? But I've also heard it said, no, when a door closes, you turn the doorknob and open the door again because that's how a door works. But the reality is there are some doors that can only be opened by one who is greater than ourselves. The church in Philadelphia was under pressure. But even in the midst of that pressure, in the midst of human weakness and frailty, there are opportunities for God's strength to be made manifest. Even, and maybe especially, those who are weak are granted the privilege of peering through the door that Christ opens to look at the world with different eyes and glimpse the spiritual reality of what God is unfolding. So what kind of door are we talking about in this letter to the Philadelphian church? This isn't just any door. We're talking about matters of the kingdom of God. And the door to the kingdom of God has been opened by the one who holds the keys. Jesus Christ is the one who has the key of David, and what he opens, no one can close again. But in a sense, Jesus doesn't just have the keys. Jesus is the key. As we consider what it means to talk about this open door, we can sense that point number one, the door that Jesus opens is the door of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, the door to the kingdom of God is flung wide open. And the salvation that Jesus has un unlocked is not merely going to heaven. It is rather the entire work of God unfolding in our lives. By grace, we are brought back into right relationship with God and with each other. By grace, we are empowered to resist sin and to embrace holiness. By grace, we are both counted as righteous in the sight of God and really made righteous through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, all that the living God is, all the abundant life that God has to offer, is present and accessible in a special way. There is nothing we had to do to open that door because Christ has already opened it for you. For the church in Philadelphia, I imagine that this was reassuring news. Their trust in Jesus may have put them in an awkward place in their community. And maybe they were kind of tired of having doors slammed in their faces. But Jesus says that this door, the door to salvation, is wide open. Won't you come in? The thing about doors, though, is that you have to walk through them if you're going to get anywhere. Maybe that's why this image of a door continues as we continue reading beyond our passage today into the letter to the church in Laodicea. There the door is a little bit different. It's closed and Jesus is knocking on it, asking to be invited in. Now when I read about these open and closed doors in Revelation, I think about how my family would stay in hotels whenever we took a road trip from Virginia to South Texas every summer. We'd usually have to get two hotel rooms because there were so many of us. And these adjacent rooms, the side-by-side -side rooms, would often have connecting doors. You know what those are? Two doors that share the same frame 
You can lock the one on your side if you want privacy, but if both doors are open, you can pass from room to room freely. I think about those connecting doors when I think about the closed and open doors in Revelation. What if those doors are like the door of our hearts and the door of the kingdom of God? Sometimes we might be afraid to open the door of our hearts. Maybe we're worried that the other door is closed. But when we open the door of our hearts, we discover that the door to the kingdom of God has been open and waiting for you the whole time. The question is, do we dare to cross the threshold and embrace the abundant life that Jesus is offering to us? To be clear, of course, salvation doesn't mean that our human difficulties will magically cease to exist. We still live in a world that has brokenness and human pain. But salvation does mean that Jesus walks with us through those times of difficulty. And the promise of hope does not disappear. Things are not as they seem. Present troubles will pass away, and those who persevere in faith will experience victory in Christ. Come what may, the kingdom of God is at hand. To borrow a thought from Paul in his letter to the Romans, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When we realize that our salvation is already accomplished, we can rest assured. The door is open and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. As we grow in our faith, we develop habits of holy resistance to the pressures of the world in order to endure patiently for the sake of Christ. It is said that those who persevere, who lean entirely on Jesus, will become like pillars in the temple, a testament to God's saving power and unfailing love. That image of pillars in a temple makes me think about a church we got to visit in the town of Magdala when we were on our Holy Land trip a few months ago. In this church, there is a round atrium with eight pillars. And on seven of those pillars is inscribed the name of a biblical woman who followed Jesus, Mary, Martha, Salome. But the eighth pillar is unmarked. And that raised some questions for a lot of us in that group. But then our guide said, that pillar isn't empty. It has your name on it and my name on it and the names of all those who love and serve God. Our lives are a testimony to the love of God and a means of building up and supporting the church. Indeed, we are all called to testify to the truth of God's love. And part of embracing our salvation and living the life of discipleship is realizing that, point number two, Jesus also opens the door of opportunity. That is, Jesus invites us to step into the opportunity to be his disciple and to share the good news with all the world. The call to discipleship is contextual and it is concrete. The way it unfolds for me might look different for you. The way this church community lives into the mission of God might look different than how the church down the street does it. But in every case, the invitation to closely follow Christ and participate in the work of God in the world is ever present. If only we would open our eyes and notice what is happening. Of course, as we already know, an open door doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be obstacles. It can be tempting for us to try to nudge that door closed again. Maybe we're scared that God might actually change our lives. Or maybe we're experiencing a season of hardship or doubt, and we don't feel like we can step through the door. But the funny thing is, just when we want to hunker down, Jesus says, nope, the door is open. It's time for us to go. Now more than ever, 
We cannot play it safe. But we must shout the name of the Lord and call the world to look, pay attention. Something amazing is happening. Can't you see it? I wonder how we might be able to call our community right here to notice the new life that God is still bringing forth. What opportunities for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ are popping up in your life? Are we making the most of every opportunity to point people toward Christ? Even when we feel small and weak, things are not as they seem. Because even in littleness, there is enormous potential that God can use. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, had something to say about the incredible power that even just a few willing and faithful people can have. Towards the end of his life, he was corresponding with a colleague about their concerns for the future of the Methodist people. And Wesley explained the only thing he was worried about was that people would become complacent or more worried about their reputation than their relationship with God. But then he goes on to say, Give me just a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin, who desire nothing but God, and I care not a straw whether they are clergy or lay. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. What impact might we have in our community if we embrace the opportunities that God is putting before us how might we comfort the hurting or feed the hungry? How might we welcome the stranger or stand up for justice? How might we offer them Christ? Dear friends, Jesus has already opened the door to the kingdom of God for you. But you have to walk through that door. Will you accept his invitation to step inside? and take part in the wonderful work of God that is still unfolding all around us? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we give thanks indeed that you have made the way for us. We give you thanks for the great love you have revealed to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you give us the strength and courage to follow him wherever he may lead. When we feel weak, grant us perseverance. When we feel small, help us notice the enormous potential you have instilled in us. And above all, O oh God, grant us eyes to see what you are doing all around us. Amen.